Right. Here we are. Yes. We've got over it. We have. This is good. <sighs> All good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We've mauled, we've pondered, we've contemplated, reflected. Yeah. And indeed... No, sorry, at me internal thes thesaurus ran, ran dry there. Did it? Yeah. Oh, bless it. Have Conjugated? I reflect? Conjugated? Yeah. No, we can't. <laughs> Good telling people about that. Oh. Sorry, <laughs> lovely listeners. You didn't hear that word. We could decline. Fine. We could decline. I can't decline. I can't remember how to do it. When you finish conjugating, you decline. To be fair, I was declining in Latin lessons all the time. It was just... <laughs> Nobody noticed that I wasn't supposed to be doing that and I was supposed to be conjugating instead. So, how have you been? Fantastic. Good. Hello, Hello listeners. lovely listeners. Pull up a log. Come and join us round the virtual campfire for episode 31 of Frithcast. Go like a one, a two, a one, two, three, four. Only I was doing the bit at the end. But they don't tend to count down at the end. They just tend to stop and there's, you know, applause. Listens for audience applause, not a sausage. Not a sausage. Takes, takes knees and goes home. Is the blue bottle popularity fading? No. <laughs> thinks. I can't think of a thinks. <coughs> Unthinks. <laughs> Oh, play his new signature tune. Yeah. In case you're wondering what you've tuned into, this is Frithcast, episode 31. 31! 31! I'm Suzanne Martin. I'm a UK ambassador for TAC, which is the Asatru community. And I'm Kate Martin. I'm a druid who lives here. Hooray! Yay! That's getting shorter, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I just... We I'm need to like extend the. Now we've got the hang of the intros. We need to kind of, you know. I'm getting. I'm just getting more efficient. That's the information that people need. Yeah, yeah that's it. So, so, lovely listeners, you might have gathered that we've both got the lurgy, but we will heroically soldier we're on. We're not well. We're so not well. The primary buffle panel has come off our Goram ship. Yeah, <clears throat> and we are nannered. We may experience some slight vibration and then explode. Turbulence! <coughs> turbulence and we then explode. Ex we may experience some slight turbulence and then explode. So welcome to episode 31. Welcome. That was the scratchiest <laughs> one. <laughs> I do my best. Okay. Welcome to episode 31. We had a chat about the Ragnarok in the last episode. So I thought we'd have a bit of a chat about Soot in Soot, this episode. the big fiery guy. The big fiery guy. This is a fairly good noma. I'm going to be using it for the rest of the episode. He's a Jotun from Muspelheim, but he will henceforth be known in this episode as the big fiery guy. Well, I don't wish to seem disrespectful or in any way superficial. Mm. But the only image I've seen of him was in Thor Ragnarok. As a big fiery guy? As a big fiery guy with a horny hel helmet. Now, I know we don't do horny helmets, but he had one. He did. And you can look at the film if you don't believe me. No, 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 I've, I've got you. He did. So that's the image again I've got in my head. I'll try and shift it <clears> and <throat> put something a bit more suitable in. But, but, you know, just know that when you say so, that's... That's where you're thinking. That's... Okay. So let's refer to him as the big fiery guy. Okay. So you know where we're coming from. Indeed. Now, he's one that is mentioned in the accounts of the Ragnarok. And he guards the borders to Muspel, Muspelheim. The realm of fire. Mm. So he's the big fiery guy in the realm of fire. 
Are you okay with it so far? <clears throat> fiery guy, big fiery guy, realm of fire. Got it. All good? Yep. Okay, cool. So when the Ragnarok is called and the armies advance onto the plains in front of the hulls of Asgard, mm. he is described as a big fiery guy yep. with a big flaming sword. Okay. And his big flaming sword and him being a big fiery guy means that through the Ragnarok, he basically destroys by fire everything. Okay. So as the battle is going on and after the battle is finished, he is destruction by fire. He is fire unfettered, okay. unchained. This, to me as a heathen, is quite paradoxically interesting because you take a dozen heathens and you put them on a campsite and the chances are the first thing they'll figure out is where they pack the mead and the second thing they'll figure out is where they can build a good fire. Mm. And once they've built it and got it going, they will all sit round it in a circle and just sit and cool. be... I say cool. Warm. Warm? Yeah. Warm knees. Warm knees. Very important, have them out. Very important, have them out. Very good. So this gets me thinking a little bit on <clears throat> fire... In the heathen worldview. Okay. It is the realm of Surt, Muspelheim, the fiery realm. Mm. It's one of the two primeval forces that helps bring the worlds into being. In the beginning there was fire. In the beginning there was ice. Ice, yeah. So the two come together and they start that chain reaction of events and beings off which results in the worlds. Okay. So his realm is there right at the beginning of creation. And he is there right at the end mm. of creation. Does he start out... <clears throat> at, I mean, does he live throughout, then? As is far like... as I know, the only mention of him that I know of <clears throat> is in the Ragnarok. Okay. He is the... As far as I understand, my knowledge may be lacking. It's all good. It means I've got stuff still left to learn, which, yay, I'm very happy about this. But as far as I know, the only time that he is mentioned is in the account of the Ragnarok, which we talked about last time. It's in the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda mm. of this account of the portents, the battle, and the battle itself, and what happens after. So he is only mentioned, as far as I know, in that portent. But the realm that he comes from is right at the beginning of creation. It's one of the two primeval forces of creation. Okay. Fire. Fire in a heathen worldview, it, it gets me thinking. And we as heathens, we quite happily use fire. Yeah. Some of my favourite moments with our friends have been sat out in the middle of nowhere and we've got, you know, we've cut a turf. Popping them into the wicker man. And... Yeah, no, the other times. No. Oh, okay. Sorry. Not those ones. We don't mention those ones. All right, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I almost derailed my train of thought. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <sighs> no grenades. <laughs> Get excitable as to choice. <laughs> no. Um, shiny. No. <sighs> it's okay. We're fine. We're fine. Everything is fine. So it makes me think about how heathens relate to fire and how heathens use fire. Mm. We use fire now as something sociable that we sit round. Our houses are heated in the main. They are. Our houses are warm and they're lit in the main. Mm. We've got electricity. We've got hot water. We we've don't got a little bit of insulation left. Also that. We don't use fire for these things anymore. No. We still fear fire as a society. Mm. We had huge wildfires in the news a couple of years back. That's true. When fire rages out of control, it's terrifying. Yes. It can very, very easily and very quickly lead to loss of life in all manner of circumstances around the world. Mm. But what we used to use fire for was heat, was light, was warmth. It sort of got me thinking about how we used fire then and how we use it now. Mm. How we would use it then was not only to heat and warm our houses and provide light, but was also to do things like create a forge for tools. Yes. And without tools, 
and without a forge, we have no helmets, we have no swords, we have no scissors, we yeah. have no nothing made out of metal because we can't forge that without a fire. Mm. You know, you can do coal forge, but to be fair, you know, if you're using anything with moulds in it, arrowheads or otherwise, you're needing a forge to do it with, even mm. if it's an open fire one. So you're certainly not going to get very far militarily without being able to forge things. And without understanding, not necessarily the science behind metal craft, but what songs you have to sing to make the metal do what you want. Mm. What spells, what glamour, what glam you have to weave into it to create the protection you want from it. Mm. The Havamal tells us of songs that they sing. Yeah. Fire can be something as simple as a candle. Mm. I will put candles on my altar sometimes, or I will burn incense, but in a way that's a very small spirit of fire that is inhabiting that space. Yeah. So can I look at that candle and see its relation to wildfire, or see its relation to a campfire, see its relation to a forge fire, a hearth fire, any of these things that we would use fire for? Yeah. And fire can be, in those circumstances, an incredibly helpful thing. Without warmth and heat and light, people probably wouldn't have survived as long as they did. We would We would certainly still be living a very basic existence. Yeah, without um, the knowledge of what fire is and what it does. I mean, one of the questions about you know people who sort of speculate on what forms life, what other forms life might take, mm. you know, elsewhere in the universe, and they will they will say, well the things you need for life to take hold to a, a, a level as advanced as, I say, advanced in inverted commas, mm. as ours. I mean, they've, people have speculated, you know, what if you find a, a, a planet that's entirely covered in water? Mm. Uh, it might have life on it. It might have, you know, fish and whatever, which, is, which it might. Doing the fishy thing. But it won't have an advanced society because they can't make fire. Mm. Because they've got nowhere to put it. So for me, it's kind of a paradox. Mm. It's this incredibly destructive element that can wipe out everything mm. when loki takes on the trials at utgard he faces wildfire which eats everything mm. we'll talk about we'll do that story because it's awesome later on yeah but it eats everything destroys everything consumes everything it is the ultimate transformer if you like yeah of matter into other matter yeah it's one of the fastest ways you can transform food. Oh, certainly for that era, yeah. <laughs> clothes. And then you think, by preference, do you burn a body or do you bury it? Mm. There's certainly examples of both throughout the Viking Age. And if you go to, I think it's Repton, there's a, ce there's a cemetery there, or not too far off, where the Great Army winters in the UK. Yeah. Where you have a mix of internment burials and cremation burials. So you have this, you know, not necessarily a preference for one or the other, but again, you're using fire to transform, mm. a fire to create. So when I light a candle on my altar, I'm not only putting myself into that headspace to start talking to the gods, I'm also putting my preparations forth and starting to step into that sacred space, that divine space. Mm. But by striking a match, by that scrape, click and fizz of that match head on the box or that click scrape and then the little puff of the lighter yeah i'm not only creating sacred space by lighting candles and creating that sacred time i'm also evoking the memory of muspelheim okay and of funeral fires and of hearth fires and of campfires where i've sat with friends mm. and we've sat into the dusk and watch the embers dance up into the sky and we've laughed and there's a horn gone round and somebody's sung a song and then somebody else has recited a poem somebody else has told a joke and it's just become the most wonderful place of kinship yeah. of frith even if you don't know everybody around the fire to start with you get to know them there have been a couple of occasions at the, at the larger camps that we've had dancers and drummers and chanters again going around the fire creating that sacred space mm. so when i light a candle 
I'm also remembering Lord Soot and his potential for destruction. Mm. I'm remembering the hearth fire. I'm remembering the funeral fire. I'm remembering the forge fire that lets us create tools. Yeah. That lets us advance. That lets us create nails and rivets to put boat planks together. That lets us create fittings for bridles. That mm. lets us create shield bosses. That lets us create all manner of cooking pots, cooking utensils, fire boxes. Yeah. All of those are in that single candle flame. And if I light more than one, that power is intensified and I can focus on what that fire is. The Havamal tells us fire is incredibly important because your guests need to be warm Mm. and dry and you must bring them, you know, clothes that they can dry themselves off on and give them a fire where they can warm themselves up. It's a basic tenant of hospitality that your halls must be warm your home must be warm your hearth must be warm you must keep your hospitality warm Mm. but not too warm because too warm you're going into destruction i suppose the same could be said of any energy source really um that anything that you can use to create energy for warmth and you know light and cooking and all that kind of thing can be ramped up yeah, can release to, its energy out of control yeah you have to know how to handle it mm. if you are lighting candles in <clears throat> your home please dock them safely yes oh it's, do. The, it's do. the other side yeah of being responsible if you are lighting a campfire know how to put it out yeah you know be able to to damp down <clears throat> the ashes in the following morning and spread them out and replace the turf yeah. And repair, but do it safely. Don't give it an inch. Do not give it an inch. It will serve serve us very well, <clears throat> unless it's given an inch. Yes, but then, you know, how do you define how to control something primeval? Mm. Are you better not? I have got little tea light candles that I can light with a match, and I've got electronic tea light candles. Yeah. <laughs> For when I want to go outside and it's cold or it's damp or it's raining or it's even got the slightest breath of wind, which will take my tea light candles and just go, and they're gone. Yeah. So I have electronic tea light candles. Yeah. It may not be traditional, but safety-wise, it works just fine. Safety-wise, and if it still helps you get into the right uh, yeah mindset, the right, then I will take that. But even those focus on a battery and electronics. And even that, the spark. And electronics. Can still flare. And electronics is electrons. Yes. Some of the the most basic. Powerful things in the universe. Yeah. Yeah. And this is and this is where this is where I tend to go. I suppose it's a similar similar sort of scenario really. Uh, because I I tend to look on I mean it's it's not that it's an instinctive thing that flashes into my head every time I see a candle. Mm. as such but you know it it is often instructive to sit and reflect on the fact that that campfire that you're sitting next to is is a microcosm Mm. of the fire in the sky every day you know i mean from obviously from a scientific standpoint a star isn't just fire it's a lot of other stuff going on you know but the but the 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 simplest way of representing it is to say that it is the you know, the, the fire that warms us all, yes. brings life to the earth, could potentially cause phenomenal destruction if the conditions were right or wrong. Yes. Do you understand that you are then imposing your control on it? And for me, I don't think I have that amount of power to control a flame which is a servant of Muspelheim. It's a, mm. it's a gateway, it's a door, it's a connection to that realm of fire. That I am putting in my home. But is Muspelheim simply lending you a little of its power to do? Yeah. A to do something. A simple thing in your home, as the sun is lending you a little of its power. Yeah, every day. As you might, as you might look at it that way. As the sunner, yes. 
you know, it's yeah. So we've we've gone kind of deep philosophical thinking in the last couple of episodes. That, and kind, a little of, bit... that kind of went reflective. Didn't yeah. yeah. Actually, you did make me think when um, you talked about the uh, the songs that you sing to metal yes. while you're forging forging it, and it it reminded me of a. Uh, I forget exactly where I was, but I was talking to. I think it must have been like at some craft. Yeah. event or something and I was talking to someone who was forging they'd got a little forge in a in like a stall and they were they were sort of uh, beating hell out of something on an anvil and um they were talking about controlling the temperature of the furnace mm. they got this uh little was it like a little gas with... furnace or a coal it was no they would they'd got a they'd got a uh I think they've got a gas one they'd got a gas one but they were talking about how you would control with uh, you know, in a in a proper With just coals. oldie yeah. worldy sort of thing, and I was interested in how they controlled, how they measured the temperature. Mm. And he said, the color when you uh, heat an object, mm. you've got a a, a, a metalized. They, they re, it's referred to as black body radiation. The ideal object is a, a a sort of hypothetical thing that doesn't give out any light of its own. So you know, call it a, a sheet of metal or, mm. or a block of metal or whatever. And you heat it. And obviously we've all seen it. We've all seen, you know, if you've seen a, a, a forge at work or whatever, you'll see that the, the metal gets red and then when it gets really hot, it gets orange. And then yeah. if you can keep heating it, it'll eventually go white. Yes. And yeah. then if you can heat it even further, it'll start going blue. Wow. And that's ridiculously hot. <laughs> blacksmiths, uh, d- to my knowledge, I'm not, a, I'm not a blacksmith. I don't know the, the, the art or the craft, but to my knowledge, they don't heat things to, to blue. No, um, but that is how you do it, and, and 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 a good blacksmith has such a such an eye for the 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 exact shade of color. Mm. Uh, they that they know exactly what temperature it is based on what color the the object is giving off, and it's exactly the same thing that happens with stars. Mm. Um, our sun is sort of yellow yellow white, but one that's cooler will be, will look redder, and one that's hotter than ours will look white and eventually blue oh wow so a good i'm sorry i'm digressing slightly mm, no it's good but a good uh, a good a, a good comparison <clears throat> to make is if you look at uh the constellation of orion the hunter mm. and if you can see orion depending on where you are uh on the uh, on on the planet obviously you, you may or may not be able to see orion but have, have a look at it on a, a star map or whatever and you'll see it's usually represented as the looks like an hourglass Yes, it's usually yeah. represented as a, as, a, as a hunter wearing a tunic. Mm. So he's got two stars, one star on each of his shoulders, yeah. and one star on the, each side of the hem of his tunic. Yes, and three across the middle, three across are the almost middle. not quite in a line. For his belt, that's yeah. right. So as you're looking at the constellation, if you look at the top left shoulder, as we're looking at it, so mm. his right shoulder, left as we're looking at it, you'll see a star that looks kind of orangey, mm. and that is the star Betelgeuse which is a red supergiant star. It's very, very big, very, very old, and quite cool for a star. It's, it's gone, very, gone very red, ready orange, and, and uh, it's, um, I forget exactly what the, the surface temperature is, but it's not, it's a lot cooler than our mm. sun. At the opposite corner, the bottom right corner, mm. there's one star that's very, very blue, and that's Rigel, which again is a, is a giant star, but it's incredibly hot, burning very, very fast, just chewing through nuclear fuel at such a pace and it is so so hot that it's gone blue wow and you can actually see the comparison most stars are too small to see them but it's, just, it's quite clear on that because they're so close together wow it's worth having a look but i sorry i completely <clears throat> no it's it's all good i mean it's yeah these it's episodes the, the kind wisdom, of go in the wisdom of the forge, sometimes yeah. it's uh, from blacksmithing to stars to cert to candles all fire though yeah all fire I think for me, when I think of Lord Surt and his flaming sword, it's a way of him reducing the world and transforming it for it to sink under the waves, for it to start again, to come up and start again and mm. build the worlds anew afterwards. But the only way that that can happen is if he totally destroys the old one. Yeah. So the destruction by Surt and his sword must happen so that life can start again mm. afterwards. And the gods can come back and continue. And so, all of this will happen again. And all of this will happen again. Lord Soot, for me, he represents necessary destruction. Mm. It might be destruction that when I first see that destruction, 
I'm thinking, well, that was pretty horrible and I've no idea what use that could have ever been. No. And I don't know why that's happened. I don't understand what the pattern is. Mm. But I can't see the long game. I can't see the reasoning behind everything that happens. This is the eternal problem, isn't it? Yeah. There's a few of the deities that can. Mm. They see the long game. They see what has to happen and when it has to happen for other things to fall into place. Yeah. So when I light a candle, I can focus on what fire is, why it is so necessary but ultimately can be so destructive. Mm. All in the same piece. It's all of those and none of them because it's a candle on my altar. Yeah. But it's that and there's layers of things behind it. And it has a link to all those things. And it has a link to the hearth fire. It has a link to the smithy. It has a link to light and heat and warmth and hospitality. To life. But it also has a link to destruction. Yeah. And that ultimate power of transformation in burning, of taking one thing and creating another thing from it, Mm. in the burning of it, creating it into ash, which can be very useful in the right circumstances. When I think of Muspelheim and I think of Soot and I think of the Ragnarok and I think of Muspelheim, in the beginning there was fire and in the beginning there was ice. But I'm also thinking of the Ragnarok. Yeah. And Soot with his flaming sword destroying all the lands, transforming them. Because he needs to do that as part of the the sequence. As part of the sequence. Mm. But I also think of things like wildfires. Mm. And I think of things like house fires, but I also think of hospitality in winter, sitting around the campfire with friends and talking or listening to somebody singing and just being in that space and time. I think about all these things when I light a candle and all of those things are in that candle and none of them are at the same time. It's kind of big for that little scrape strike of a match Mm. creates fire. Or even if you do it the old-fashioned way, with a flint, you can watch the spark catch. Yeah. And that little thin reed of smoke come up and you know that it's sat there. That ember is waiting for you to feed it, mm. for it to become into what you need. It's strange. It's, it's so many things we need for hospitality, warmth, light, cooking, forging, destruction. Mm. All in the same thing. So yeah, we probably ended up going a bit deep with this episode as mm. well. We're going to stop it there for today, lovely listeners. Yeah. And, you know, give your brains a break. Give my brain a break, because... Brain. Yeah. We're, yeah. I, whew, we're honest truth. We're sure your brains can have no problem with it at all. But ours need a breather every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my brain needs a break. <laughs> thanks. If you don't mind. Okay, thanks. Bye. Going now. Indeed. Yes. So, we'd like to stop it there for today. We will. Hopefully we've given you a little bit to think about. Hopefully. And we will talk to you all next time. If you'd like to find us online, my name's Suzanne Martin. I'm one of the ambassadors for TAC. And you can find me on Facebook as Suzanne Martin or on Twitter at Suzanne TAC, which is T-A-C. If you want to find me, I have a sorry excuse for a website. (laughs) Blastrain.net. We'll put it in the notes. Yeah, it'll be fine. Just just use it. as It's got my... My Facebook and Twitter and stuff link from it. So yeah. You can use it for that. All good. And you can read my rubbish posts if you want as well. That's good too. But I put some. I put one on, up like every now and then. So thank you for listening with us tonight. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And we will talk to you all next time. Bye-bye then. Bye bye then. Bye. Bye.